this presentation we're going to talk about Remote Connector. Uh, that's the service that allows VPN-less connection for Swixit and I'm also going to talk about uh, the next generation clients that's on iOS, Android and the Mac and there is also coming up a new Windows client which is very similar to the Mac client. And the reason for the presentation is to update you on the changes that were made since the release of the next generation clients and uh, some changes to the initial training that was done on Remote Connector when it was launched in 2015. So in this presentation we're going to start off by going through how the Remote Connector connects and how we get through firewalls etc and then go on to how certificates and we deploy the software to allow this to happen. So we're going to talk about connecting Swixit, the current version of Swixit, without a VPN and start off by just looking at uh, the majority of installs which is a single server with a single internet connection. So since the release of 2015 and the remote connector there is this additional service and although I've shown it here uh, as being installed on a separate machine you can of course install this on the Swix server and it is by default installed as a service on the existing Swix server but as I said it can be installed on a standalone machine. So your standalone machine is connected via its firewall to the outside world and we have a Swixit client that is preloaded with a client certificate and like I said we'll talk in the second section about how the certificates are generated and how they're deployed. But for the moment we have a remote worker and they're going to connect to the service. And it starts off with the client making a call on port 16203 out to the web which hits your firewall and you just need to port forward that to the machine running the remote connector service. Now if the client gets no response on port 16203 it will fall back to try 57203 and again when this hits your firewall all you have to do is port forward this to the remote connector machine on the same port 57203. And that's all very good until you get to the situation where you're in something like a public Wi-Fi hotspot in a hotel or something like that where you're stuck behind a firewall that has port blocking on it. Most of these public firewalls will only allow port 80 or HTTPS port 443 out. So the client will drop back to 443 which will hit your firewall and you need to send this through to the remote connector but in this case you have to do port address translation and forward 443 public to 16203 on the remote connector machine. And we need to do this because the remote connector is only going to listen to port 16203 and port 57. 203. So once again the way the client works it will start off by sending a request on 16203. If it gets no response there it drops back to 57203 and if all else fails it will send the request on 443. So that's the ports you have to open up and the forwarding you have to do on the firewall. Now these are the standard default ports used by Swix. They can be changed with the use of registry keys and more documentation about that can be found in the Swix technical manual which is in the documents directory on the DVD download. So that's how we deal with a single server and let's now look at the master and standby scenario again with a single internet connection. In this case we can make use of the separate ports. So again 16203 is the first attempt so you should port forward that to the remote connector service running on the Swix server. If that fails the request comes in on 57203 so you forward that to the standby server. So making use of that drop back facility. So that's the existing Swix it soft client. Now let's look at our next generation clients. So along with the remote connector service we now have an additional authentication service. Now this has to run on the Swix server, it's part of the CDS service 
and it is installed automatically along with the Switch server. So we have these two products that are going to talk to our next generation clients. So the process here is quite simple. The next generation clients will initiate a request on port 9101 and they will send the Swix username and password for the user. So if you're using Windows authentication on the LAN, uh, for those running next generation clients, uh, they also need a Swix logon username and password. And that comes in on port 9101, as I said, and that port is forwarded straight through to the Swix server. In response, the Swix server will issue a certificate back to the next generation clients and also inform those clients of the location of the remote connector service, the IP address they need to connect to. At which point the next generation clients will use the first of the two ports, 16203, if that's the one that's been uh, issued by the authentication server. Uh, that forms the TLS tunnel opens it up through the remote connector so in your firewall again all you have to open up is that 16203 and point it to the remote connector service and the system is up and running and the, as I said uh, the certificate is issued by the authentication server so there's nothing to pre-install on the clients. Moving on to those all important certificates this is how we handle the encryption etc. Uh, there are two ways to uh, get certificates on the system uh, the very easy way is to use automatically generated certificates. This is done during the install procedure and we'll go through that in a live demonstration shortly. Uh, these are very easy to generate and very easy to deploy. Alternatively, you can go for a manual option where you have to procure the root and server and client certificates yourself. Obviously the server and client certificates need to be signed with the root server certificate and there are plenty of details on this about the standards and the certificate types required and you can see this again in the technical manual and it's in chapter 24 for more details on that but we're going to cover the automatically generated certificates and show you how it works so as a topography we have a root certificate generated during the install that root certificate is used to generate a server-side certificate which the server will issue to any service that uh, requires it that's the remote connector service on master and standby of course and it will also generate a client certificate which then has to be installed on the client PC so we're going to cover all of that in this live demonstration so let's now go through uh, configuring the certificates and setting up Swixware for the remote connector service. The first part of this is done during the configuration wizard. So we'll just run the Swix configuration wizard. This will usually be done during the initial setup of Swix, but obviously, as I'm doing here, you can go back and change the certificate or uh, install it on an existing system. And here is where we will enable the remote access. So the authentication server, remembering back to the uh, slide previously, in here we're going to put the Swix server public IP address which has port 9101 forwarded through to the server. So you put your public IP address here. Obviously, if you want to use a fully qualified domain name and you've got that registered on public DNS, go ahead and do so. And here we put in the remote connector server. Usually it's the same machine, but it can be installed on a standalone machine if you want that added security and put that in your DMZ. And that's port 16203 by standard. Next, do we want to manually install the certificates and like I said you can refer to the manual for more details on that we'll go for the simple method which is the automatic one so we'll select automatic and go next and we generate a certificate this only has to be done once and you need a password do not forget this password if you do forget the password 
uh, you're going to have to run the configuration wizard again and enter a new password here which will then invalidate any existing certificates that you've pre-configured. And click OK. After a short pause, it will generate a new certificate for you. And this thumbprint will give you an indication that the certificate has been generated. So we've got both the root one and the service certificates generated here. Next. And just complete the configuration wizard. And now we can go to our Swix administration console and go to our users and start creating the certificates for the users. This process can be speeded up and automated with a PowerShell script and I will show you that shortly but for the moment let's concentrate on doing this manually. So I'll go to an existing user, in this case John Smith, and we go to administration and this remote connector button. And at the moment we can see there's no thumbprint in here. The user does not have the ability to use Remote Connector at the moment. So we'll click New. At this point we'll need that root certificate password. So you can see now if I've forgotten the password I'm going to have to reset it and uh, go through all this process again. So I put the password in and click OK. I have to tell you at this point we haven't yet checked the password and the certificate has not been generated. If you read here it says the client certificate will be created if you click OK. Click OK and after a short pause the certificate has been successfully generated. I can double check that by going back into administration going to remote connector and I can see the thumbprint there has been generated. And as I said in the previous slides, in order for this user to be able to access the remote connector service, they do need a Swix user logon, username and password. So we need to confirm that that has been generated by going to the properties for the user, going to authentication and check that the username and password has been configured here and we'll just reset this password because I can't remember what it was and now the client logs on on the LAN Now the user's logged on, we go to settings and local settings and then into connection and then go into advanced. And down here we can see that the automatically configured certificate is available. So we can see that this user has access to the remote connector service. Only remains for me in here um, to set the credentials here so I put in here the public IP address or SIP URI of that port that's forwarded to the Swix server and if there is master standby then I can put in a second IP address there if we have a failover or a master standby scenario with a separate IP address we can do that and by default the remote connector service is called automatically. So what happens here is the user will launch their Swixit client, the client will try and log on initially over the LAN, if it gets no response from the LAN when it times out it will then use the remote connection service. There is a small time sacrifice having to go through this procedure every single time. So if the user is always out on the road, out away from the office, then perhaps tick this then the system will never try and initiate a logon on the LAN it will always go to a public IP address to start with so that will speed things up of course if the user never leaves the office then you can switch it off and it will never fall back so that's how we get the certificate onto the client automatically
which is fine as long as the client comes into the office. Uh, what if the client never comes into the office? Well, you can either open up a VPN and get them to log on to Swixit through a VPN, or you can manually issue a certificate to them. And the process for doing that, again, this can be uh, speeded up with PowerShell, and there are more details of that coming up. But for the moment, we'll go through the slightly long-winded manual method. You go into the user properties, and go to administration, remote connector, and we can now export the certificate. So we go next, next. A password for the certificate, because we're going to email this over the internet. So, uh, simple password, next. File name, and I'll just put this on the desktop. Mark, set, save next finish so we now have a certificate for this user which we can issue manually to the client so you email this certificate to the client and then all the client has to do is follow this procedure double click on it and go next and next the password to unpack it and it is very important now that you tick this box here mark this key as exportable if you do not tick that, then the Swixit client is not going to be able to access this certificate which we're importing into the Windows Certificate Store. So you must tick this box. Next, next, finish. And this user now has that certificate. So you can launch his client and under settings, local settings, connection, advanced, and we're not going to automatically access the certificate. We're going to go to manual and in the drop down list, you will find that certificate, that Joe Smith certificate I just generated there. And you can see it has a time for 10 years. So the certificate's valid for 10 years. Click OK. And now the user is set up. And that's how you generate the certificates and that how you deploy them. Like I said, the easiest way to deploy the certificate is just to get the user to come into the office or log on via a VPN and fire up their Swixit. Otherwise, you have to go through this import procedure. This can be speeded up with the use of PowerShell and for those that uh, want to give that a try, there's some information coming up shortly. And finally, just a couple of quick tips to go through and an observation. If you remember back, uh, the old ways of connecting off-site clients into Swix was a VPN. And we had this problem where two remote users could speak to anyone on the LAN, but when they tried to talk to one another, the media stream would go point to point unless your firewall allowed that connection with static routes then there was never going to be any audio. Well, all that has changed with the remote connector service because now the audio stream from the top client uh, will go into the remote connector service and then back out again. So the remote connector service also proxies the audio so we don't have to worry about this. Uh, static routes inside VPN firewalls anymore. The remote connector will do it all for you. Uh, a couple of other points and some registry keys for you. On the client there are the remote connector registry keys now where we can change that usage from always automatic or never use and we can put in the public server name and the backup server name or IP address in these registry keys on the client side. The other two issues we have are the web extensions. Now obviously web extensions if you've written your own you then have a problem that that web extension needs to be contactable externally. So you'd have to write that into the web extension with the right port and have the right forwarding done uh, on your system. However, if you were using visual contacts and the fax client, because at the moment these will be pointing to an IP address which is not contactable from the outside world. Via registry keys it's possible to tunnel this information through the Swix server and on visual contacts for example we can use these registry keys so the 
web extension for visual contacts will talk to the local machine uh, the local machine will then tunnel that through to the server and as long as the SDOS is running on the Swix server then you'll have no problems and similarly for the fax client the fax client uh, will not go through the tunnel unless you do this and it's effectively pointing the server name in the fax client to the local loopback address in which case we'll tunnel the information uh, through the tunnel and you'll have full use. So for visual contacts and Swix fax client use those registry keys and you can also deploy the clients uh, public server name and backup server name via registry keys which will save you having to get the customer to manually enter those in to each of the systems. I mentioned earlier in the presentation that uh, there are some PowerShell extensions to do with this. Uh, new commandlets, so uh, they're listed there and you can use these for example to generate the certificates and here's an example script which you could copy in and it will generate user certificates for everyone rather than go individually into each user and generate the certificates. More information about PowerShell, more information about uh, manual certificates etc can be found in the Swix manual. I uh, hope this presentation has made things clear. As usual if you've got any questions uh, just jot them down below or drop us a line and uh, we'll get back to you. Hope it was of use. Until the next session, thank you very much for your time.